what are some of the really great human skills that you've learned that actually do help in genuine connection? Stop worrying about what other people think of you and start realize what they're worrying about what you think of them. I was really worried. I was walking around, look at that guy, he's short, he's got a big nose, he's like a nerd, he's a loser, whatever it is. And then you realize, no, they're all worrying about being judged by you. So instead of trying to take validation from other people, giving people validation. Yeah, that is such a brilliant insight. And to operate from that point of view and to make somebody feel seen or heard or understood is about the best thing you can give to someone. Your career is a fascinating one um, uh, because a lot of a lot of people in sort of authors and stuff like that have an idea set. They sort of build upon the idea set. You had an idea and got very famous for an idea set that you have completely or well, almost entirely walked away from, which is the game. First of all, I want to know the history of how the game even came to be. Um, I remember when it came out and the buzz that it, the stir that it caused. It was quite a sensation in its day. Yeah, I don't even think it would come out today. <laughs> let's, let's let's tell people what the game was first of all. Yeah. Um, so, and I'll answer what the game was is the same as how it came about. So, the, the one and the same thing, which is, and I already had like a career prior to the game, meaning I was like writing at the New York Times as a music critic, and and I go to all these concerts. Uh, I'd even go on tour with rock bands for running for Rolling Stone. So, I'd be around a lot of. Uh, energy, sexuality, those kinds of things. And I was super shy, really nebbish and nerdy, uh, more so than I am now. And I wouldn't even be able to have this co this conversation if not for the game and look you in the eye and have this conversation and express myself. So I I just saw everyone having all the fun. I was never the one having the fun. You know, I went on tour with Motley Crue and thought, this is going to be decadence. And maybe it was, but not for me, <laughs> right? I'd even go get backstage passes and hand them out, hoping to meet someone and they just say thank you and go backstage. Doing something wrong. Why 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 is everyone else like I just again I was really lonely and anyone I'd met, I'd end up like in the the friend zone while they're dating some guy who's a jerk to them and I'm like consoling them. I even remember I did a book on Marilyn Manson at the time and his manager remembered a story where like I think I had a crush on someone and I was like painting their room while they went out on a date. I was just the worst. So then I had a book editor. I'd done a couple books, and my book editor, Harper Collins, uh, came to me and said, I found this undercover community of pickup artists, and they're guys without money, looks, fame, and they've figured out how this whole thing works. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do a get to collect their information, do a how to book? I said, Listen, I'm a journalist for the New York Times. I'm like, got a serious career. That's not something I do. So, no, thanks. But thank you. Thanks for thinking of me. But secretly, I'm like, There's a community where these guys know this stuff. <laughs> so, and I, I'm not having money, looks, or fame. I thought this is great. <laughs> so, so, so I began this double, double life. Like I changed my name, not to go online. I changed everything. I had this double life that I was actually scared of being found out. Yeah, yeah. So I started meeting these guys, and their their idea, their personalities, their ideas were so fascinating that I thought, oh man, this this is a book. And so, I remember when I wrote the book, uh, I wanted to write under another name. I was so scared. Okay, so the book came out. So the book came out. And a lot of guys used this book to pick up women. And it was described by the women as highly manipulative. So, yeah, it's interesting versus what the book actually was versus how it was seen in the culture. Right. There's a difference between, let's say, the techniques, the guys, the pickup artists use in the book and what the book is. Like, the book literally begins. It's the funniest thing, by the way. And this isn't a bad thing. I don't mind. Like, I think when you do create something, yeah. you throw it in the culture and now it's out of your control. Correct. And I'm happy they have any story about it. Yeah. Like, I'm happy anyone's reading it, you know, or read it. So, so it begins with the greatest pickup artist in the world trying to kill himself over a woman. Like, he's suicidal. It begins with me taking him to, like, a mental health crisis center. So is that really a book that says this is going to end up well for you? You know? It, like, literally it begins with that guy, like, and then the end is really about, like, how it's turns you into a robot and destroys your personality. And to me, the game, again, I was super naive at the time, I guess, but to me, I, the game was a book about male insecurity. And I literally thought, and I'm really not, I really mean this, is when I wrote it, I thought women would have more confidence when they saw how insecure and fearful men were. I have a female friend who yeah. read it specifically so she could know when men were behind yeah. her. And she tells this great story of sitting on a plane and some guys, you know, saying whatever he's saying, and I don't know, I don't remember any of the principles, like, say something nice, then insult them, like, whatever it was, you know, right. some of these weird principles. And 
she literally turned and goes, I read the game. You can stop. Yeah, no, no, exactly. And and there's there's so many sides to it. It's so complicated and and and, and nuanced. And uh, um, and for sure, it ends with Lord of the Flies. All these sure before toxic masculinity was a term, it ends with all these fake, you know, self-taught alpha males in a house all like trying to out alpha male each other it's almost like just become so toxic it's kind of a book about bro culture isn't it i mean it's like that's what it is well here's the difference it's a book about neurodivergence yeah bros don't read this book bros are they're already like you know they don't need this they're too cool you know they they've already got off but most of the people i met and there were by the way there are few like real monsters in that world for sure but most of them met were neurodivergent people who were trying to figure out how to socially interact and just needed a map i mean i struggled with dating um most of my life you know and i've talked about it publicly a lot of adhd you know um and so i overcompensated for the adhd by jacking up with coffee before a date right out of fear of not being funny of not being charming yeah and so i needed to get you know the, the boost of energy for the evening and i would come in like a bull in a china shop right you know and just i thought it was very funny and charming problem was i was doing all the talking you know right I get it, that it's a right. story from new, neurodivergence. I wonder what, you know, he, so here's a question. Like, there's, somebody, there's stuff you, said, you could never write that again today. You said. Right. A, why? And B, what about the principles that you learn in the game could be translated for people who are struggling with neurodivergence and meeting people today? I think you can still learn the same things, but without the agenda or the goal of an outcome. Like, let me, how do I start a conversation with someone? Like, right. how do I get comfortable with myself? How do I actually connect? Uh, um how do I move things? How do I ask somebody who I meet online, like out in person, what's a good way to do that? So the difference is, is your goal to connect yeah. or is your goal to like take? And I think that's what it's about. Yeah, I think in So, so, so just share one of the tips, like if somebody, um, you know, how, how, how to make somebody feel heard and seen, you know, like what, what are some of the good tips that, you know, because I think yeah. people do struggle to commit. Yeah. It, you know, a lot of us are struggling to connect these days. There's, and there's much said about addictions to cell phones and social media being disconnected, you know, COVID, blah, 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 you know, the list goes on. Oh. So what are some of the really great human skills that you've learned that actually do help in genuine connection without, without some sort of... Yeah. I mean, I think like if I, I, I think I'd have to ask that question with me now versus me then, I, I guess. Uh, but I was going to say one of the thing, which is I think when the book came out, I got a lot of calls from like salespeople, marketing people, the FBI called me to come in and train their agents. So like, so I think those applications, it's really just understanding social dynamics. And I think it's really important. So the first step I think is just really understanding social dynamics and how they work and what uh, people want and what they're looking for and what their agenda is. So I think one step is just really understanding social dynamics. But I would say like the biggest thing is, is to stop worrying about what other people think of you and start realizing that they're worrying about what you think of them. I'd say the most freeing thing I learned then, and I think it's even more that I do it maybe 10 X more now is that I was really worried. I was walking around. Everyone's just laughing. They're pointing. They're like, look at that guy. Sure. You've got big nose. He's like a nerd. He's a loser, whatever it is. And then you realize, no, they're all worrying about being judged by you. So instead of trying to take validation from other people, giving people validation. So I think that was the biggest insight you know which is while, while we're all walking around worried about what people think of us what we don't realize is they're walking around worried about what people think of them that is such a brilliant insight and to operate from that point of view and to make somebody feel seen or heard or understood is about the best thing you can give to someone yeah and even and and you're gonna think well i do this but here's a here's an example of how we don't do it so we're la you know, i'd say you're at the la stand and someone pulls up at a bright yellow loud lamborghini and gets out and you right away you want to be like or what a douchebag, right? Or what a asshole or whatever it is. But instead, you just want to, want to say like, hey, nice car, man. Like that person just wants, they were driving around on that thing because they just want some validation. So yeah. instead of like you judging them, right? Bright, bright yellow. Yeah. For people to see it. So there's an exercise, again, like I really do think they're there to be seen. Yeah. So there's an exercise where you, to get over social anxiety, you go out and try to make three or four people feel better about themselves that day by saying something kind about them. The best way to solve your problems is to help other people solve the prob the same problem. Um, you know, I've talked about the 12 step programs of Alcoholics Anonymous right. or, or any other 12 step program. Right. Um, you know, uh, it, they know that if you master the first 11 steps, but not the 12th, you're likely to succumb to the disease. But if you master the 12th step, uh, you will more likely overcome the disease. And the 12th step is to help another alcoholic, right? Which is service. 
Right. So if like if I'm struggling with how to find love, how to find a job, how to find you know happiness, the best way to do it is to help somebody I care about find love, find a job, you know, find happiness. Yeah. And, and I'd say the other, for for sure, I think like being other oriented instead of self oriented is a nice way to put about and put it. And I think we'd probably be a better world that we end really like not being needy energy. So the other side is like when someone says my pet, one of my pet peeves is when somebody says, you know what, I did that for them and they did nothing for me and they didn't repay that. Like people get so upset if they do something kind for someone and that person then doesn't return the favor or do something kind with it for them. Like you do kindness just is as an end in itself. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are people who go out and maybe give people compliments or they listen to people, they try to help them, but they're trying to get something for it. Right. They make that connection because they want, so you really have to do it purely with no neediness. I think the most biggest turnoff is when someone's just too needy. Do you still see yourself the same way as you did when you wrote the game? No, not at all. <laughs> no, like, like barely. <laughs> I mean, I really think like the bigger transformation I had was like, was, uh, <laughs> no surprise was going to sex addiction rehab. So, so that was, that was really the bigger transformation. So, so, uh, so clearly there were things that led me to the game. Yeah. That came not from the game itself, but came from like my upbringing. So I think the bigger, the game maybe, to me, the benefit of what I learned in the game was like it showed me that I can change that. And then I think, then it was question, well, what, even if you recognize the game, was what drew me into the game? What seduced me by the, that lifestyle? Why did I become so obsessed with it? What was wrong with me? <laughs> you know, even if the book, you know, even if the end I said, oh, this is bad, what, what caught me up in that and everything? And so I remember I was having a dinner with like, two other writers who wrote probably like the most famous books on seduction, that kind of thing. And we found, and we were just talking, we found out we had the same kind of mother figure in our lives. And I said, well, well, that makes sense. It's a fear. It's a fear of the feminine and trying to figure out the tactics and the techniques is to make you safe from something you feared because you grew up with, with a toxic narcissist. Okay. Well, I can't leave this behind. What did you learn at sex addiction? counseling reform yeah before then i thought i was the uh i was the normal one who wrote about all the eccentric damaged people the pickup artists in the game the rock stars you know uh, for rolling stone and then i realized uh, i remember this moment where you do your timeline did you ever have to do that your timeline and so i wrote down all my peak positive memories and peak negative memories from zero to 17 sat there therapist is across from me and she goes well, you know why you've never been in a healthy relationship? I'm like, no. And she goes, because your mom wants to be in a relationship with you. And that's when, is as surreal, as weird as that sounds, like even at the time, and she's like, and there's a name for that. It's called emotional incest. And I'm like, what the? Well, my logical brain is going, what the fuck? But well, my body like felt this truth of it. All of a sudden, all my childhood stuff made sense. Like, again, like just to go to overshare, like being grounded all the time, like massaging her hand, like her coming to my room and complaining about, how my dad was in bed, uh, um, not being cut off when I wanted to want to live with a girl in like uh, college or something. Uh, all of a sudden, everything just made sense. My body felt the truth of that. And I think it's true that in the culture, we, we understand abandonment when a parent's not there physically or emotionally, but we don't recognize enmeshment because it feels, what's the word for it? It's like falsely elevating. Like abandonment is, it, you feel like nothing, but when you're enmeshed, you're like, oh, I'm mom or dad's special person i they talk to me they share this stuff with me or i make them feel better when they're sad you it's sort of i take care of the family it's sort of falsely empowering and so it's hard to see and recognize and then i recognized and i realized that uh there was a part of me that was like afraid to just be vulnerable and surrender because i was afraid of being swallowed up again thanks for sharing that yeah um you're very you're very open uh, where did that come from being around people who were struggling and being forced to be open or have you always been, there's a difference between being open with yourself, which is difficult. Right. And then, yeah, I mean, I think two reasons. One is I think maybe when I was writing for Rolling Stone and I would always encourage as an interviewer being on the other side of it, I would really try to get people comfortable enough to be open. And then also honor that when I shared it, I wasn't, would never do a gotcha thing. So when I was on the other side of the microphone, I re did recognize that, uh, I need to give what I wanted. And the other side of it is like, my whole goal was just to be a health, healthy, continue working to be a healthier person. And I think if you create a split between who you are and who you present, that's super unhealthy. 
Mm. I think that's most people, right? You know, in some way, shape, or form is kind of life. Now, some sort of artifice is required, you know? Like, you know, I think when you meet people in professional or personal context, we all want to project some sort of confidence. Right. You know, we can't project defeatism. We never make friends. Right. I mean, there's always a bit of artifice, and I think this is where relationships, you know, you become vulnerable. You know, it, you start to break down the artifice. But to your point, which is if we never break down the artifice, then that's unhealthy. Yeah, I think there's lines of what's healthy and unhealthy. So I think healthy is being vulnerable. Uh, and then the other side, so one side is being vulnerable, but the line is, and then the other line is healthy shame. Healthy shame is when we need to have a little bit of shame so that we don't, because everyone's in this world that we get rid of shame, shame is bad. Every emotion is good, is in the right, uh, in the right degree. Healthy shame is, well, we're going to wear clothes while we're together, <laughs> you know, uh, we are going to, uh, <laughs> depending on where we're getting together, I guess. <laughs> exactly. It's like, show up on the first date with right. clothes. How can you? I have no shame. Right. Exactly. We're all wounded. <laughs> How by... do you know shame yeah. is actually an right. expression? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like we're all, all our wounds, like all our wounds came from people who were shameless. My mom was shameless with her boundaries around me. Yeah. Right. People were shameless with. Let's say that again. People. All of our wounds come from others who were shameless. Yes. They had no shame, which is this, which is, can be said, you know, they, they violated boundaries. Right. And that that lack of shame created woundedness. So draw the line for me, because we're this, we are all the products of our upbringing, right? Warts and all, right? Yeah. yeah. Where is the line of accountability? You know that we we say, look, I am like this because you know I was enmeshed with my mother. So the difference is accountability. I'll say for me, my accountability is a hundred percent mine. In other words, so regard it doesn't matter how your mother treated you. I'm responsible. You're responsible for your behavior. I see myself. Because I don't want to speak for other people, I see for myself that I'm I'm responsible for the stories I made up about that, and so that allows me to then change. If because if I'm responsible, then I'm in control of the changing it. So I see for me that those are variables that occurred. These variables help me understand myself. <clears throat> so there's no blame involved. I mean, certainly there are cases where people are straight up perpetrators. There's a place for everything in the healing process. The healing process to me is sort of a a few steps you go through at certain times. And and just like you were saying, the 12th step of AA is the service. I think the end of the healing process, if you're trying to heal something, is the forgiveness piece, where you actually, and again, m most people never get there. I understand it's really challenging for some people, but that piece of forgiveness that you can forgive yourself, and even let go of any energy you hold around the other person, and that's real freedom. I was going to say this, it's, there's, there's two kinds of people, I think. So <laughs> there's people who like... Uh, try to bring others down yeah. right to get to like them or there's people who kind of like to raise themselves up as well as all the other people that we're I not that, I think it's binary okay that's not my binary right yeah, I think there's the, the, there are no other <laughs> okay. it's okay. true to, to feel better about yourself you know, there are many things you can do you can lift others up or you can bring others down I yeah. think that's true and I guess my question or something I'm just seeing in the culture out there's so much criticism of trying to bring others down yes I can even see it having been a journalist for a long time that as soon as like suddenly Mark Zuckerberg is a sex symbol now, right? Or something. I don't know. I was people were literally like, oh, he looks hot with that gold chain or I don't know what is going on. And he wants his AI to be open source. Somehow Mark Zuckerberg, I see him going back up on the pendulum yeah, yeah. in this moment, in this exact moment working yeah. this conversation. But the culture likes to take people and kind of bring them down yeah. as soon as they get big. And yeah. then when they're little, they want to kind of bring them back yes. up. What do you think that is in the culture that we have to, you know, if someone gets too arrogant or too big, we they have to be sort of... Kept in check. Kept in check. I think we've become a very finite society where the idea of vision and idealism um, is almost lost. And, you know, leaders do not speak in idealized terms anymore. They don't speak of um, imaginary futures that will never exist. I have a dream. You know, all men are created equal. You know, um, ask not what your country can do for you. Like, you know, shining city on a hill. Like, these are all idealized states of the world that will never exist, but we'll try and build. When there's vision and there's idealism, we all share in that vision, or a lot of people will share in that vision. And we feel community and we feel supportive of the people. And like lack of vision means it's every man for themselves. It's every person for themselves, you know? And we've doubled down on rugged individualism. And so if I'm insecure, I cannot bear the thought that you're and you're happy when I'm not. And and it's easier for me to bring you down and lift me up because that's hard work. And I don't I feel very alone. Yes. And I think I think everybody is feels like they're forced to be on this journey by themselves. I think we've been on this road of of 
of feeling lonely and feeling like you, we've heroized CEOs. Right. It used to be the company. Now it's the person. Yeah. You know, we've made, and th that's the problem, which is we now live in a world of I am the genius or I'm not the genius. I am the success or I'm not the success. And we've completely forgotten that we're social animals and all of these things can only happen with the love and help of others. Yeah. I, I am not successful. And I've said, I've even shared this with like my friends. I say, you, 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 I, I'm the front man. So I, I, people give me all of the, the love, but make no mistake of it. Anything I've accomplished in the world, you are due some of the credit. You were there for me when I couldn't. You were there for me when I doubted myself. You believed in me when, I, when nobody else did. And I, there's no way I can take all the credit. But I guess the other question I'm thinking is just, well, what is success? Like everybody's in their own lane. If I think, I'm just thinking about what you said uh, as far as like, make sure everyone gets a credit in your team. But then I also think that everybody has a wheelhouse where they're great and where they're trying to improve and trying to be better and recognizing them for, for that. I think somebody who makes that choice to just just not work and raise a family or not work and just travel the world with their partner or to sacrifice family and travel and adventures to, to try to create art or create political change. Like everything is equally valid. And it goes back to my, I'm realizing it's fun having this talk because I'm realizing how I think yeah. uh, versus you not asking me the standard sort of questions um, that uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible, the, the, the advice is, and I'm not even a religious person, but it's about, grow your own garden, plant it, grow this beautiful garden, and know it doesn't really make a difference, but just be happy doing it. And I think if, if everyone's finding the thing that they like doing enough and they're creating something more beautiful or something that doesn't hurt others, I think there's not much to it. And, over the I, don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Go ahead. I think, it's an, I think that's selfish. Go ahead. Which is, you know, we are individuals and members of groups. We're social animals, but we're also ourselves. And yes, you're you, but you're also a father, a friend, a member of a community, you know, a partner, you know, like you have social responsibility and you, your behavior Im does have real and significant impact on the lives of others, as you explained about your own mother, right? That had significant impact right. in your life. Um, and so I, I do believe that we have a personal responsibility to plant our gardens as just be satisfied, yes, as an individual, but as a member of a group. I think we do have a responsibility to leave this world in better shape than we found it. You know, if you work for a company, leave the company in better shape than you found it. Leave this country in better shape than you found it. Leave your family in better shape than you found it. Like, I think... But how do you... Like, that old parable of the of the horse, the Zen parable of the horse, do you know that one? It's a good one. Right? But it's like, how do we know that we're really leaving in better, better shape? What's the parable? Uh, I mean, the parable is... And just stop me if you know it, but the farmer... This farmer, I'm going to butcher, like, everything, but the farmer... You're going to butcher uh, the horse? They're going to butcher the horse, like, everything, yes. So, so... Uh, <clears throat> There's a, a farmer and his horse runs away. And everyone's like, that's a horrible thing. That sucks. You need him for your farm. He goes, I don't know if it's good or bad. We'll see. Horse comes back and brings a bunch of other horses, wild horses back back with him. And they're like, look at you. Now you have like five horses. You're like the richest farmer in the whole territory. Look at you. Uh, that's amazing. He's like, I don't know if it's amazing or it's not amazing. We'll see. Mm -hmm. And his son's riding the horse and his son falls off, like breaks his like really badly. He can't walk. <clears throat> he may never walk the same again. Like, oh man, that sucks that happened to your horse. If only that horse had brought all those other horses back. He's like, I don't know if it's good or bad. We'll see. And the next thing there's a draft and uh, the son isn't drafted because he broke his leg and it saves his life. And the story goes on and on and on. Yeah. And we don't, we could, you could go change, create the biggest, best, fulfill your exact mission. And maybe because of that, someone else reacts against it and creates a bunch of evil in the world. We, do, we don't know the outcome of what we're doing. Yeah. In the big, big picture, there's so much complicated cause and effect that you may save someone's life and they may go on to kill 10 people, right? Like, you know, that, that that was the right thing to do and now 10 people are dead because, you know, we, we don't know the... I always have to say, I have the saying, the outcome is not the outcome. Like, that's just a finite outcome, right? It goes back to everything we're saying about the contracts and everything else. We don't... But I'm, what I'm saying... But here's what I'm saying is... That doesn't mean to... Here's what I'm saying. Responsibility for contribution it, just because it might not work out in the short term because then to your own story which is, by the way, the quintessential story for infinite mindedness, which is, yes, but then, but then, but then, but then, like, we don't know. Okay. What I'm saying is be responsible for what you're actually responsible for. Don't assume that my goal, like, I think when we're saying there's no effect you can control outside of yourself. I, I So so doing the right thing, doing the right thing, I think we're saying the same thing. I think thing. we have a violent agreement here, yeah. which is control the things you can control, be responsible for the things you're responsible with, but do it with an eye of contribution. 
yeah, I mean, I think, again, I don't know. I don't want to tell people. So for some people, contributing may not be the right thing for their soul. I, 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 I have to tell people that uh -huh. contribution's a thing. There might be people who really just want to live this life and be alone and not be bothered and just, like, read books. I don't know. It's okay. I want to say it's okay not to contribute. It's okay. Well, I need to think about that example. Yeah. Because that example is, you don't except if you're Ted Kaczynski, where you literally are a person who's removed yourself from society, right? And by the way, he couldn't fully do it. He had to go threaten the world. I am saying be responsible for other people. Don't do things that, that you know that intentionally cause harm. Contribution is such a low bar. Okay. Right? Like ordering a cup of coffee and saying please and thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's healthy shame. <laughs> like, like contribution. Like to so we might be talking about the world. And make sure that you make someone's life that you, in, that you uh, interacted with just slightly better. Right. So... But here's here's where we it's such a low bone. But here's where we're differing. Let's go here because there's a little hair to split. But let's split it for fun. Because like you said, we're violently agreeing. So my thought is, my thought is next on this episode of splitting hairs. Yes. By the way, splitting hairs is incredibly painful for us. <laughs> yeah. It's incredibly painful for other people. Yeah, yeah. To you can cut it all out. I don't care. It's just you and I talking. I don't care about it. It's just you and I having a conversation. Okay. You want to contribute? I want to have a good conversation with you. You want to contribute to all those people? I just want to have a great conversation with you. Selfish, <laughs> selfish bastard. That's right. So, 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 and, and really like our, our whole thing on this too is like, is, um, is, is this, what if I go out and I say, please and thank you when I'm ordering my coffee, that's just the right thing to do. But I don't have the, the, uh, I'll just say extreme for fun, but I have the arrogance of thinking this is making their life better because that guy walked in and said, please and thank you. Maybe it goes back to your, your standard. Of intention. That goes back to you don't know what's right for other people. All I know is right. By the way, I, I know this. There's cultural yeah. differences, right? So in the United States, you know, if I'm in a restaurant, almost always I'll ask the server, "What's your name?" It's considered polite in this country, and then I can say, "Thanks, Stacy." You know, every time you know something comes right. to the table, you know, and that's considered a good thing. Not so in Norway. <laughs> I was in Norway and sat down and asked the server her name, and she said, "Why?" I was like, "Just, just so." Just trying to contribute here. That's what I do. I'm a contributor. <laughs> what does it matter? Anyway. You don't ask the server their name. It's considered incredibly uncouth, and they're all introverts anyway. Right. And so, like, making, closing those intimate gaps, you know, is, is freaks them all out. So, right. you know, so it, it is cultural. The, di the differences are sometimes cultural, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't learn how to contribute con consistent with whatever the norms and values are of Norway. Right. So define, define contribute as you see it. Okay, that's to take responsibility. To, I think goes, it goes, we, we talked about accountability and, and responsibility. So that I am accountable and responsible for my actions and my words and will attempt to go through life in a way that um, my actions and my words leave whatever situation I'm in slightly better than when, I, than when I showed up. Right. And it's a very, that's a hard standard because you can't do it all the time, obviously. But I think sometimes it's much easier to do like good leadership, you know, is the fundamental responsible to leave people in better shape than you found them, you know, like to, to lift people up, help them learn a skill, push themselves, whatever it is. You know, I mean, that's what parenting is, to leave your kid, you know, equipped, you know, not just self-raised. You commit to raising a child so that they're better than raising themselves. That's what good parenting right. is. Right. Right. And I think that all of these things are difficult and all of these things are strivings and we are imperfect at all of them every day. But but I think as an ambition, I, I would like to I would like to know that my friends have a better life because So can can we can we do the right thing without needing to be responsible for the outcome? Can we do the right Can we still have the motivation to do the right thing with others at all time without taking on responsibility for the outcome? It's a hard question. I think I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes, but it goes back to intention. Like if, if your intentions are good, I think it's hard to fault you, you know? And the means matter more than the end. Right. So so here's my thought. I think I figured out the hair. <laughs> you guys are thinking, wake up now. Here, <laughs> um, all right, I figured out the hair. This is it. You and I say the same thing. We're, we're drawing the responsibility, the boundary of responsibility at different places. Say more. Okay. So my, my boundary is right here. 
you brought it, I feel like Neil, it's over Neil, there. For those who are not looking, the Neil has just made an <laughs> between him and I, because we are no longer friends after this. No, so is here. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying is this. Yeah. All I can control are my so in my in my All I can control is myself. All I can control is myself and my and I, can, and I can't control. withdraw so in other words I can control you or anything else. I want to contribute. So let's say I want to contribute to your life and I say take that trip you want to, you always want to take and then the plane crashes. Well whether you take it or not. Or no, I'm not responsible for playing no, what I'm saying is oh, what I'm saying is with yours things, I want to contribute. So you have to if you want to contribute, then it means you also have to take responsibility if your effort to contribute ends in a disaster. So I encourage you to take that trip you've always Which means if you're measuring and the plane crashes I, you're now responsible. If you're in the afterlife, by your version, God then gives you the scorecard and say, here are the, all the people you interacted with. These people's lives got better. These people's lives got worse. I, you try to do the right thing, but unfortunately, it's like 74 to 22, so I'm sending you to hell. <laughs> no, I'm not cynical, but I'm saying it. No, I'm not cynical. I'm, I'm, and I'm not even going to say that I'm, I, I'm uh, healthier because, that's it. because, because. Um, because I'm really just saying, like, I, I uh, if I'm saying I want to make sure I contribute to everything around me, I can. Have, it's different. My intention is to contribute, but contributing it, then it's really exhausting because I'm responsible for all the outcomes, all the outcomes. No, you're not responsible outcomes. for the outcome. Just like it's. I mean, like, contributing is I'm measuring myself. Like, what I'm happens to you after our interaction? Whether we're right or wrong, whether this is good or bad, um, is irrelevant. What I really like about this conversation is it's. Anyone who's listening is forced to think about this. Yeah. Like we're forced to think about it. Or, or they're forced to just press like the 2X button on their or, podcast or, player. We're forced to just <laughs> give it to another podcast. <laughs> yeah. Buy supplements. So, okay. So let me just try to summarize the points that move on, which is this. See if this sounds right to you. <clears throat> I, think we're, I think what we both share is we're, you're trying to be kind and do the right thing yeah. and be thoughtful about the way you interact yeah. with each other. My version is... That's enough of an end to itself. You're adding the extra piece of the thought and the goal of contribution. Yes. Did it. <laughs> we still friends? We should just do our own podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Start <laughs> hair splitting. Philosophical hair splitting. Good and you on the side. So back to what I said, like I really, I, I really listen closely and I really want to understand. I don't want to, I mean, I both want to understand for myself if there's something to learn or, or to like, to, to think, to, to, to think about that. But I really sense a the theme in what you're saying, which is like, you really, uh, you really sort of. Um, uh, he, he, here's here's think somebody said, said to me once, yeah. right? I got this advice. This is literally how they delivered it. Right. So I got this advice once from someone. They said, Simon, you live in the world. Right. Like you're not alone. Like, like, like you, you live in a world. There are other people, there are interactions. Right. And like you can't be completely blind to that just because you just because then your own definition of kind. You know, your own definition of kind has to be relative to the world you live in. And what I would say is you live in your world, and he lives in his world, and I live in my world. And we also live in this world. And, and your world interacts with my world, whether you like it or not. And my story interacts with your story, yes. and his story yeah. interacts with our story, yeah. and we're all living out of these very different stories. You have a contribution story. I have uncertainty story, Right. And this is just two stories, two stories meeting. <laughs> but the point being is this, I see the world in terms of story, right? In terms of like, everybody's got a story. Wars are fought over stories. We need, uh, we're being surrounded by enemies. Everything's story. Yeah. Either people have a story they tell themselves. People have a story they sell to others. Yeah. People have these stories. So what I'm playfully challenging is saying, well, it's good that we buy our own story and it's good if our story adds something good to the world. But maybe at the end of the day, recognizing we're just trying to live a story you believe in and believe it's the right thing. In the end, we really don't know. And that's my positive note for this. <laughs> but I think accepting uncertainty is part of happiness. We're completely in alignment. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my talk of contribution it doesn't eliminate anything you say. Yeah. You know, and I think uncertainty is a large part of it, which is why everything we're talking about, like the fact that we even have a conversation about it. Right. And we really are splitting hair. Right. We totally are. We are in the loop. Yeah, yeah. That's right. right. Um, the reason is is for one reason and one reason only, which is uncertainty. Right. I I don't actually know, and neither do you. We have no idea. And and I find that magical and empowering because uncertainty is the place where things can happen. Yeah. I mean, I think also if people accepted uncertainty, we'd be living in a better, safer, happier world. It's so hard for people to accept. Yeah. Neil, 
thank you. Um, you always get me thinking more. This, this, even though this is the end of the conversation, this won't be the end of me uh, thinking about the questions you've raised. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more optimism, check out my website, simonsinek.com, for classes, videos, and more. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.